What shall I do today? Tell us more about Jesus. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> what shall I do today? Tell us more about Jesus. Tell us more about who? Jesus. One time, this is the most powerful, the most beautiful name above all other names, so let's have it three times. Whom? Jesus. 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 <laughs> anyway, next time I'll test you. So today, today we see Jesus healing people and above all, we'll be moved by his deep compassion. Seen in the powerful healing of a leper in the terrible, hopeless situation that he was in. But we'll begin somewhere else. So Michael, could you read number one for me? As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. With James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her once. At once, he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. So a lot of marks have these words like immediately, as soon as, or just then, and so on. So it's all about decided action from Jesus as he moves around the land. Uh, the Sabbath is just about to end, not yet quite yet. And Jesus is here in full solidarity and engagement with the common people and their common needs. Past pace, which is compressed time, and we see authority of Jesus here. Mm -hmm. And we see his very decisive actions. Jesus is all sufficient as a healer. healer. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need spells or incantations or anything about that. Just the touch, the compassion, which we'll see very strongly later on. Oh, it's going to have to whisper now. The absolute simplicity of his actions as he reached out, touched, and expresses that deep compassion. So, first of all, Peter's mother-in-law is healed. It says, in order to serve. So the way of Jesus, he heals us and gets us ready for the way of serving. That's an essential kingdom uh, characteristic. He, he later on says, even I, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve. So Jesus brings and exemplifies this. Have we been touched by Jesus like Simon's mother-in-law? Or are we serving Jesus and others as well? Make sure you are. Second story, Lindsay, you won't get away with doing anything today. <laughs> oh, can you read number two? <laughs> Mark 1, 32, 34. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick of the possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the doors. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. They were a bit afraid of breaking the Sabbath, so they waited till it was over. Mm -hmm. Simon Peter's mother in law was quite a, a happy for Jesus to heal her then and there. And we'll talk about that later. So they're at late afternoon, at the end of Sabbath, and we see the desperation of the sick. We have great pathos here. And the door of compassion is wide open. And Jesus and his healing power was wide open to them. And Jesus tells demons to be silent about who he is. Well, what is that? Well, reason one is tactical. Think of the Romans and their great fear of revolution. He doesn't want to alert them straight away before the time has come. And same too for those religious leaders in Jerusalem. He doesn't want them up there quite this early. The second reason is, as we've seen before, Jesus is anointed to be both the Son of God and the suffering servant of the Lord. And his job is to change and transform hearts, and that's not done by forcing people, but by doing it in a gentle way. So a gap of time is preached, probably about three years, a gap of time, so that Jesus can do what he does without being crucified too early. That's the point of crucifixion, but no, uh, no value unless you knew why it was to be done. So, uh, Sonia, could you read them three for me? In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out and deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. 
When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogue, and casting out demons. So Jesus seeks prayer to determine God's direction for his ministry. There's been a whirlwind of activity, and then Jesus sees a point of stillness, a place of prayer to be with his Father. There's no mission for Jesus without him going back to his very source, the Father. Even for Jesus, the Son of God, so how much more for us do we need to seek this place of silence and ask God for his will for us each day? Jesus is above all the son and the servant, as we saw at the baptism. The son, one in being with the father, and the servant, one whose purpose is to do the father's will. And doing that will with him by serving him and serving others. So Peter and the others pursued him, or better still, hunted them down, hunted down Jesus. They threw the Peter. Here is opposing Jesus. Later on at Caesarea Philippi, he will uh, say something good about Jesus. But Peter is not to control the work of God, but to follow the Son of God. Not to tell Jesus what to do. So here he seeks to do something which is a negative act. To seek to control Jesus and his agenda. And thus not to submit to Jesus. This is just mere enthusiasm, not faith. Indeed, it opposes true faith. And throughout the gospel, we have this um, enthusiasm over here and faith over there, and they're not the same thing. It's easy to confuse that. Peter is saying, Hey, Jesus, capitalise on your notoriety in wonder working. Well, perhaps something like that. Peter decided that uh, this was to be the mark of Jesus' mission. So Jesus is endangered by those close to him. Yet, Jesus is not deflected from one thing, God and his purposes. Simple, decisive response, uh, uh, Jesus has a clear purpose in God. Next, we'll go to the important passage, the big uh, climax of everything. So I can ask David to read them the four for me. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, Shoes, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer your royal cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter. A leper goes to the priest not for a cure, only God can cure leprosy, but to be tested for being cured as it is commanded in the book of Leviticus and when a leper thinks he's cured, he goes to the priest, he'll examine him, and then give him a certificate to say he's been cleansed. Maybe Jesus is at this moment on a missionary outreach to a nearby village when he comes across this leper. Now leprosy is described in Leviticus 13 and 14, and there's a lot of superstition and fear around it. Um, it's not really about curing leprosy as regulating it in the face of this terrible disease, which is so uh, contagious and contaminous. Um, lepers' lives are lived alone outside the camp. It's sentenced to a form of living death, it's said to be no way different from a corpse. Josephus, the living death. And the rabbis, no way different from a corpse. It robbed the person of his health, yeah, but much more. Their name, the occupation, the habits, their family, their fellowship, and especially they can't be in the worshipping community, worshipping God. 
So it's got both a medical and a social dimension. And your appearance becomes very ugly as well. It's not a nice thing to have. You weren't cleansed of, of leprosy, you were cleaned of it. It's deeply feared, very infectious. They were to live outside the town, mainly alone, but there was separate federal colonies in some areas. And all have got to stand at least 50 paces from them. Anyone who's been in the house with him is polluted and contaminated and compromised. So, bearing all that in mind, Jesus, very unexpectedly, Jesus touched him. Touched him. Immediate social contact, just as we will have with the tax collectors and sinners later on. Jesus turns to him. And then we see the outstretched arm of Jesus. Think about those people who are doing Exodus at the moment. Such an action speaks far louder than words. Isn't it? The leper begs Jesus on his knees. See the humiliation that that long-suffering disease brings. He is uncertain. Jesus gives him a firm re reply. It reveals the very heart of Jesus. He's not questioning whether Jesus has the ability to heal, just whether he is willing to heal. Mm. Jesus, you can heal me. I have no doubt about that. But do you want to? Mm. That's my paraphrase. He actually says, if you choose, you can make me clean. Mm. And then we have the unbelievable response from Jesus. Jesus <coughs> did choose. And his response is just as scandalous as the leper's daring audacity and boldness in, in preaching in approaching Jesus, which he shouldn't have done under normal circumstances. And Jesus doesn't recoil from that. Oh, get away, you dirty horrible! <laughs> leper, get out of my sight. Does he do that? No, he moves towards the leper. Well, how much I've got to pay for you? Jesus is moved with pity, full of compassion. Now the man must go and see the priest. He's to do so not to be cleansed, but to be examined and then given this certificate so he can go back to normal life. And Jesus is so full of compassion and moved with a huge pity. In Exodus, Moses stretches out his arms usually to announce a mighty act of God, usually one of the plagues. Often, it's not just his arm, it's his staff as well. It also says in the Old Testament that God, with his outstretched arm, did this, that, and that powerful thing. Now we see the mighty arm, not zapping the leper. What does he do with the outstretched arm? Moved with passion. Mighty hand, arm of the Lord to heal. Have you noticed that when you've been reading um, Exodus? There's a challenge to the temple here as well, um, because and something which we'll talk about later on as we go. But Jesus is not ready to reveal everything about himself yet. He's public. It's all about Abba, Father, or better. Dad behind all he does. It's all based on prayer. He needs to know when to speak, when to be silent, and to discern wisdom and have confidence, so he's so often in prayer. We see Jesus' contagious holiness. Jesus is able to cleanse a leper and not be contaminated by him. Holiness flows from Jesus to the victim, not the disease from the leper to him, as it usually happens, yes? Very unusual. So we have a positive view of holiness that goes out and makes clean. People then and at that time firmly believed the opposite, of course. Yet that's not what happens here. This is Jesus. Here instead we have the contagious holiness flowing out from Jesus in the opposite direction. We began with a leper somewhere outside the town like the annual scapegoat. He then trades places as Jesus moves from the village outside and 
that's a pointer to the future. So Eileen, number five, please. Out of the anguish of his soul shall he see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, to make the intercession for the transgressors. He shall bear their iniquities, yeah. he bore the sin of many, he makes intercession for transgressors. And those who are Christians know the holiness of Jesus coming from him to us. His righteousness being transferred to us. The righteous one, my servant, will make many to be accounted righteous. And that happens just after our sins are gone from us onto Jesus. And the Old Testament reveals that in the last days, all uncleanliness will be wiped away. Number six, please, Michael. And on that day I will remove from the, the land the false prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Remove from the land the spirit of uncleanness. Jesus is concerned not to as concerned to avoid excessive publicity, mm -hmm. not like the salads and politicians who crave it today so mm -hmm. so much. Jesus is not hustled to increase his reputation, just lets it happen. The crowd marvel, but that's not enough. This falls short of like, the enthusiasm, marveling, so even saying, wow, that is not enough. You need faith. That's what Mark's Gospel say. The great explosion of power fills them with awe, but they do not see that this explosive fallout, like an atom bomb, will change everything for good. But this fallout is life, not death. Above all, the crowds do not yet have faith. The only acceptable response to Jesus, they don't have faith yet. Do we know, do we know this man? Do we want to know this man better? Do we have faith? Do we have faith yet? Let's pray. Father, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like we saw Jesus here. Mm -hmm. Enable us to walk in close contact with you all the time, like Jesus did. Let us be in such close contact with you that we know what we should be doing each day. Increase our faith and our trust in you. Give us that deep compassion that Jesus had in abundance. Help us love and serve you. And we come in, as to all we come in contact with today and for the rest of our lives. Heal us so that we can serve you. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found that sermon helpful and would like to join us again on another Sunday. In the meantime, you'll find resources available at our website, on YouTube. So please do take the opportunity to have a look, but let's hope to see you soon. God bless you.